nonprofits exist for one purpose, to help provide a solution to a community problem. And so for me, I always focus the case for support truly around communicating the value of the impact, what we can do with your support. I'm Rich Frazier. And I'm Russ Fanos. Welcome to the Nonprofit Fundraising Exchange, a podcast from IPM Advancement. We believe strong nonprofits can change the world. And our goal with each episode is to bring you insightful conversations with thought leaders from the nonprofit sector. Let's dive in. Hello and welcome to the Nonprofit Fundraising Exchange. I'm Rich Frazier. My co-host and friend, Russ Fanoff, is under the weather today, or as I like to say, it's Friday. (laughs) So he won't be joining us for this episode. Seriously, though, he texted and said that he's lost his voice. So Russ, check down in the sofa cushions. It's probably down there with the remote control, and I hope you feel better soon. We miss you. On today's episode of MPFX, we are talking about capital campaigns. After two years of putting projects on hold, many nonprofits are shaking the dust off building projects and renovation plans and moving forward with feasibility studies and capital campaigns. Today, we're going to talk about best practices in capital campaigns, making sure your organization and donors are prepared for a campaign, and the do's and don'ts and ways that campaigns may look different in 2022. Joining me are two of my favorite consultant friends, Jarrett Ransom and Alan Knobloch. Both of you have been on this show before, but if you don't mind, introduce yourselves again for our listeners. Jarrett, let's start with you. Thank you so much, Rich. It's uh, an honor to be back. I'm really glad to be here. I live in the Phoenix metro area. I work nationally, and some of you probably know me as the nonprofit nerd. Certainly not offended by that title. In fact, I'm really excited and coined myself that because what I found, Rich, is I would say, oh my gosh, I can nerd out about this for hours until you're blue in the face because I never become blue in the face talking about nonprofit. So thanks for having me. I'm really glad to be here. Right on. And it's great to have a fellow nerd on here. Thank you. And Alan. Yes, Alan Knobloch. And I'm kind of disappointed that Jared already has the nonprofit nerd uh, taken. So I will uh, grant her that. I've been in the nonprofit world for over 30 years, also based in Phoenix. Most of my work has been in um, Arizona. And most of my work has been in uh, principal giving, both uh, major and plan giving and doing campaigns. So uh, I'm looking forward to sharing and learning about campaigns today. Super. Thank you. So let me just say right up front, we're not going to have time today to cover everything about capital campaigns. So if you, our listeners, have follow-up questions, please feel free to reach out to us on our website at ipmadvancement.com. In the meantime, let's dive in, see where the conversation takes us, okay? Let's start out with defining a capital campaign. Jarrett, Alan, which one of you wants to take this? What's a capital campaign? Yeah, you know, capital campaign, and I prefer to to use the word campaign when it's not necessarily for capital. A capital campaign or a campaign are for special projects, things that move the organization to the next level programmatically or also help them acquire, say, bricks and mortar or tangible things that they don't currently have. They are over and above their annual program and uh, which tends to be a concern of nonprofits from the standpoint that uh, they want to maintain their annual operations, but they also want to do this project um, that moves them to the next level. Yeah, It's a special campaign for a specific goal and a specific project for a specific time frame. We have a beginning and an end, and we have a target that we're trying to hit. They hope there's an end. (laughs) (laughs) We hope so. Yeah, I was saying too, like, I really think it's above and beyond. So it's a large amount of money or a larger amount of money than what we typically would see in our annual campaigns. And, uh, you know, perhaps for that capital project or improvement. And then also it includes pledge commitments that could span over multiple years. So all of what you said, Alan, and that so much more. So along those lines, let's, first of all, let's just stick with the common vernacular that we're all familiar with, capital campaign, whether we're building a building or, or not. Why should we do a capital campaign? And along those same lines, why should we not do a capital campaign? That's a really good question, Rich. And it's one that 
I really encourage all of our nonprofit leaders to think about very seriously. For me, you know, again, what is a capital campaign? It's that above and beyond. So I'm going to start with probably why you should not do a capital campaign. And I have uttered these words before to prospective clients that said, hey, we want to do a campaign. And I said, great, let's start by telling me about your annual campaign first. Like, what what does that look like? How have you had very generous supporters? Tell me about your donor, you know, and constituency base. And they said, oh, we we don't have an annual campaign. And I, I bit my tongue and I listened and I said, well, what I would recommend is that you start with your annual first, and then you perhaps consider a capital after you give a good year to year go on your annual, because the chances are very large that you have some really good transformational donors within your donor database that are not maximized currently with your annual gifts. And that, so that I'm going to throw that out there as when I say don't do a capital, it's because typically your annual already sucks. <laughs> I think you, you hit on a real key word there, and that is transformational. And I think if your organization is at this point where you are looking at transformational change and you need some transformational funding, transformational fundraising above and beyond the status quo of what we're doing, that's a point where you should be considering a capital campaign. So let's say we, we meet that criteria of transformational change. What now do we need to look at in-house as an organization, as a nonprofit organization? What do we need to look at in-house to ensure that we're ready? For sure, the project needs to be uh, supported, not just within the organization, but outside of the organization. They need to have their constituents see it as necessary. Then you have to have adequate leadership, both staff and volunteers, in order to lead and successfully complete the campaign. You need to have your gift chart in order, meaning you have to have sufficient gift uh, donors at each of the levels, in particular the leadership levels. If you miss on that, your campaign will never succeed, and I'll underline never I think too about, you know, your accounting systems, Alan. So really looking at, you know, do we have the systems in place to properly track the, the pledges, knowing that a certain percent and that, that I'm not a nerd on. So I don't know the nerd on how many pledges actually default. I can cover you there. Yeah, <laughs> that it will be, a, you know, there will be default. And also too, for me is stewardship. So I'm, I'm big on celebration and, you know, really having that stewardship from the very beginning, all the way through the end of the campaign and the campaign isn't over as we know here. And hopefully all of you listening, it's not over once, you know, that timeline of conversations is complete. It's truly over much later, you know, beyond that. I want to pick up on a couple of things that you all said, Jared, I love what you said about accounting. Back in the day when I had a real job as a development officer, I, I lived by what my accountant told me because I am an idiot when it comes to all things accounting and I could not have done my job without that accountant, that wingman, that wingwoman standing next to me. Alan, having adequate leadership in place, absolutely 100%. So your board of directors has to be bought in to the idea of a capital campaign, and they have to be uh, bought into the idea of fundraising. I can't tell you how many times that we've come across boards of directors that are scared of fundraising to the point where they think that they're putting off their constituency by even asking for money. Nonprofits are really, they are the authorities of what they do. Their job is to solve problems out there in the world that others are not solving. And so that gives them the right to ask for money. Definitely board buy-in is, is critical. And I recommend to nonprofits that I consult for that they don't go out to public to ask for funds until the board is 100% committed financially. Yes. And that is also training ground for some of the leadership to get easier asks out before they go to the general donor population, which is a, a little bit maybe further away from their comfort zone. That's that's great. You know, and when I think about this uh, with, with both of you, Rich and Alan, I also think, you know, that leadership piece is, is really big. And to listen through the feasibility study, what the community and stakeholders say about the leadership and moving forward, even about systems, right? Like, does the organization not only have the right leadership, 
that uh, operates the day-to-day -day organization, but in addition, the fiduciary agents of the organization. And to take that further, not to mention a campaign committee. <laughs> Yes, I totally agree with that. And I wanted to, I was going to go there as well, that campaign committee, because we have to have those volunteer leaders in place. I think it's, it's a mistake to think that unless we are superhuman nonprofit, and there are those out there in the world, but most of us are mere mortal nonprofits, we are going to need those super volunteers to help us. I also want to add to this list of things that we need to be prepared for a campaign is having our plan in place. And I'm not talking about a campaign plan. I'm talking about the plan for what we're trying to accomplish, or whether it's building a building or renovating a building. So sometimes we find ourselves walking in the door to do a feasibility study, and we don't have those architectural renderings. We don't know exactly what the plan is. That's not a great starting point to build a case for support, and that doesn't build a lot of confidence with donors. So I think that the more we can have all of that stuff locked down before we start testing it in a feasibility study, the better and the stronger the case for support. May I throw something out there? And, and this is really like for me, it's pointing out the elephant in the conversation is the name of the game and nonprofit has truly become hurry up and wait. So I just want to throw that out there as a concept that is very prevalent in the culture of nonprofit. It's this hurry up and wait. And so, you know, to throw out that expectation that the campaign timeline that you think you have probably will have various renditions and that you may not actually be able to go public when you think you can go public because perhaps the feasibility study is going to take a little longer to uh, to create and to process and synthesize. So that hurry up and wait mentality, I just want you to keep that in mind when it comes to the timeline and that you remain flexible through your campaign. I wish the board of the organization that I'm working with now just heard that because we did push it back based upon their optimistic feelings that they could move forward as quickly as they thought. And I'm very much a stickler saying, until you have your leadership gifts in place, yeah. do not be in a rush. Yeah, I've said for years that, that fundraising is not on our timetable. It's always on the donor's timetable. Yep. Right. And they drive the entire timetable for the campaign. Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk about the feasibility study. Do we need a feasibility study? Why do we need a feasibility study? I always say you need, need a feasibility study. Now, I also, not only my the nonprofit nerd, I coined myself too as an innovative disruptor, which you might think I would say, well, let's just ball up that feasibility study, throw it in the toilet and flush, right? But I really do think when it comes to the feasibility study, we are testing for the case, we're testing the constituency base, we're testing the confidence in the community, the confidence in the leadership in and of itself. So to me, the feasibility study truly is that benchmark litmus test to say, are we a go? Are we a no? And that's what we need to truly determine at the end of the feasibility study. But Alan, I'm curious your thoughts on this too. I, I would uh, completely agree with you, Jarrett. To me, the most important, uh, I shouldn't say most important, a very, very important agreement is the confidentiality component. You might think you understand what your volunteers are thinking on the program. You might think you understand what your donors are, but until they're kind of in the room with just the consultant, they may or may not be telling you everything you need to know. So for me, that that's a major selling point on doing a, a um, feasibility study. Even if an organization is super strong, has a great development team, you just never know. And for sure, wanting to know where are those leadership gifts? Do you have, they have those potential? So I heard a great quote the other day uh, by Michael Lewis on his podcast called Against the Rules. And he was talking about experts and humility, that experts are constantly reminded what we don't know. And thus we move through the world focused not on what we know, but on what we might find out. And so I apply that to feasibility studies. Often it's not the purpose of a feasibility study is often, in, in, at least in my experience, not if we should do a campaign, but how we should do a campaign. We're finding out what we don't know. 
when we do a feasibility study, because there's so much we don't know. You know, we put together this preliminary case for support, and we test that when we go out and do these interviews. But there's so much feedback that we get from the interviews that make this case for support stronger and, and more compelling in when we go, actually go out into a campaign. And Alan, as you were just saying, there's so much feedback we get on this organization that can cause some shifts in how the organization actually operates and thinks about itself and presents itself and positions itself. So when we find out these things that we don't know, it, it only helps us present stronger and position ourselves stronger for a campaign. Jarrett. The other thing I've heard in the feasibility study is that another organization, another very prominent organization in the community is also in a silent phase of a campaign. And that is something that we want to know. So many of our constituencies, our donors, our supporters, our investors, if you will, you know, when someone is civically engaged, they also have this propensity to be philanthropic. And looking at that and having those conversations, many of the constituents that you're talking to for some of these leadership gifts, you're also really getting, you know, putting your finger on the pulse in the community that you may not be privy to, especially, you know, in that development role of the organization or when a consultant, because I also, shocker here, advise that you certainly bring in a consultant to do this feasibility study. So really hearing from your audience during these questions of that study is really critical because, there could be news like, oh my gosh, there is another organization, a very prominent one, also launching capital. So who should we be interviewing in the feasibility studies and who should be involved in those interviews? Yeah, I always have um, three different categories. You want to interview actual donors that you want to get involved and certainly your, your better donors. You want to interview influencers, people that can connect you with people and then interview uh, insiders, volunteers, and staff that you want to make sure are on board. Hi, this is Curtis Schmidt, producer of the Nonprofit Fundraising Exchange, jumping in for a moment. If you're a nonprofit professional who has questions about your program, or maybe you feel like you've taken your advocacy, fundraising, or membership effort as far as you can and you need some fresh ideas, then we have a special offer for you today. NPFX podcast listeners can get a free 30-minute consultation with IPM Advancement, no strings attached, when you go to ipmadvancement.com forward slash free. Just enter a few details and an IPM team member will contact you to follow up. It's that easy. That website again is ipmadvancement.com forward slash free. Thanks for listening, and we hope to talk to you soon. Now let's return to the episode. What are some other things that you are aware of or that you have seen and come across that are, are campaign truths that we all just need to keep in mind? I think up the top of my head, Rich, is truly communicating the value of the impact. So let's start. Nonprofits exist for one purpose, to help provide a solution to a community problem. So if you're having a capital, chances are the need is greater in your community and you have the expertise, the leadership, the knowledge, the you know years of experience, the evaluations to show how you and your organization have truly made an impactful, you know, positive outcome in that community. And so for me, I always focus the case for support, the narrative, the website, you know, the language truly around communicating the value of the impact, what we can do with your support, what your investment and transformational gifts will allow us the ability to do, help serve, help do, help, help be of service to our community. The need is this, we are able to accomplish X, Y, and Z with your additional commitment. So for me, I really hang my hat largely on communicating that value and the impact. So very important. Alan? I, I guess I might actually claim the nerd on this part of the discussion. To me, I really focus on the gift chart, the gifts that are necessary to be successful. If you do not 
secure a lead gift in the 20% range of the overall goal, those donors fall into the lower categories, which becomes completely untenable if there's too many of them. So that part is critical and really the nonprofit shouldn't move forward until they have those leadership gifts identified, solicited, and feel fairly certain that they're going to make that number before they move to the next level. So I'm more on the nerdy side of looking at the actual mechanics and making sure that they have in place the people that are going to make them successful on the number, the goal. And I like to follow up on that. You know, my favorite phrase is that capital campaign fundraising is not a democracy. We are not inviting everybody to make a gift yet. We want to get those top leaders, those top donors in the door first to make sure that we can hit our goal before we open up the doors to everybody else, before we go public with a campaign. And I think that, you know, there tends to be a lot of impatience when it comes to capital campaigns, when we're waiting for those lead gifts, Alan, that you were just talking about to come in the door. And, you know, we get asked questions a lot like, well, shouldn't we just send out a letter? Shouldn't we send out an appeal? Shouldn't we ask, you know, a thousand people to give a thousand dollars? But, you know, that just doesn't work. We got to focus on those top donors first. Yep. You know, Alan, I think what you just said is you're going to claim the nerd on that really speaks to the investment. I think we all owe the the campaign committee and the leadership is to say, don't fill the committee and the leadership with all people that think, act and look just like you really seeing the diversification as a positive, even by the way of how we think and what we focus on, because there is no coincidence that you and I are both on this conversation together with Rich, because we're coming at this truly in different angles, which are also very complimentary. And so I just wanted to to highlight that as we continue the conversation with so many of our listeners today, that you think about who's at your table and who are you missing and who needs to have that invitation for conversation. And that's a great conversation in the feasibility study. When you're having these conversations with the donors or potential donors, you also ask, who else should we be speaking with? Who else should be considered in this committee and on the leadership chart? Who else do you know that would appreciate knowing this level of investment is happening in the community? So that's a very valid question to really open. You know, there's a reason we have two ears, one mouth. Ask the question and listen. Let them talk. Yeah. And I think, you know, in my experience, the campaigns that have had that person who can make the a lead level gift, who's willing to take a leadership role in the campaign and go out and ask others, when you can reach that trifecta, those are the campaigns that are going to be very successful. Okay, so I think that we've covered a lot of ground with the feasibility study. And let's say that we've done this feasibility study, all signs point to yes, and we're ready to start up a campaign. I'm a nonprofit organization. Now what? How do I start up that campaign? And do I need to hire a consultant for that? And why? I would definitely say yes, especially if you've hired campaign, uh, hired counsel to do the study. They're going to know and be able to craft a plan. They're going to be able to provide truth to power, so to speak, that when you struggle internally, the consultant can tell you this is what needs to happen from other successful campaigns that you're diverting from. They can also provide kind of the uh, momentum and inspiration to kind of keep people moving forward, bring in best practices, bring in marketing materials and experience around that for the organization to design and do their best case. All kinds of uh, experience that organizations think they know, but there's always other ideas out there. I love the word momentum that you just used, Alan, and I really do believe that if all signs point to yes, Rich, then let's keep that momentum going forward. Let's work with a consultant. Again, you know, this person brings in not only a, a level of expertise, but as you just mentioned, truth to power, Alan, I love that phrase and it is so critical. And I believe too, holding that team, that internal team, if you will, accountable to keep that momentum going and flowing so that we can hopefully best adhere to that timeline, you know, of of the project and the campaign. And so really keeping everyone motivated to continue that momentum, because the reality is we all know on this call or on this conversation, rather, that there are times when the momentum 
starts to slow down, you know, and, and what do we do then? And that's, that's something to consider and something to talk about in advance, because when it happens, you want to know exactly how you're going to handle it. How do we handle that? You know, we, we, we might start strong. We might get that big $10 million gift to start off a campaign. And then things slow down. We get past that pace setter phase and, and we're into the major gift phase and, and we're just in a lull. How do we push past that lull? How do we keep the spirits high on that campaign committee? I could bring in a, a, um, an example from my current client where they really did well to get started with the board and a few good gifts came in early and they were getting frustrated because they weren't getting gifts closed. And when I looked at it, there was only one no. There were a number of, here, we need more information. Timing's not good. Come back to us next year. Uh, be selling my company and have have this issue in in 12 months. So when they looked at it from that perspective, it's like we're not being unsuccessful. We're just dealing with the realities of people's timing. They're not saying no. So let's not be discouraged about the pace. These gifts will come in. They just won't come in on our time frame. And let's pull as a consultant. We say fresh leads, fresh leads. Let's bring some fresh leads out and keep throwing those leads in front of them so that they keep having people to work. What are your thoughts, Jarrett? One of the things I mentioned earlier was celebration. And if you can't tell, I really like a good party. So having moments of celebration, opportunity for celebration, I like to, to set a good, better, and best goal. That way there's always something to celebrate. So your good is really your bare minimum. Uh, your, your, you know, good, better, and best, your better is going to be kind of that that mid range and your best um, is going to be your stretch goal. And so that way we're able to come back to the table, celebrate again, working with a consultant. Ironically, I was also a cheerleader in high school. So really bringing in this raw, raw momentum. Let's rally the troops. Let's, let's, you know, get back to our why. Let's talk about, you know, the purpose of this campaign and back to that impact, the value of the impact. So I love to celebrate all of the wins, no matter the size. I've seen that literally take a conversation from kind of, you know, woe is me, Debbie Downer to, this is fantastic. You're right. Let's do look at what we've accomplished and where we are. And to Alan's point, now let's bring in some new leads. You know, let's keep this momentum going. Love these answers. Thank you. And I may or may not have been asking for a personal reason. So let's talk about the world as we see it now, post COVID, and how that might be impacting capital campaigns. What are you seeing out there that that might be having an impact on capital campaigns? I would say because I did two feasibility studies during COVID that actually Zoom interviews weren't horrible. I thought that you're missing a lot of information that you see and um, observe in when you meet with, with uh, interviewees in their, in their um, own locations. But actually, we got good feedback. I, I still miss being in front of people and having that um, you know, face-to-face dialogue. But it worked. It was, it was better than I had thought. I'll add that one of the things that I'm seeing is sticker shock. So, you know, we started out this conversation, people pulling um, projects off of the shelf from two years ago and now testing them for capital campaigns. And that that $18 million project from two years ago might now be a $25 million project because we've got supply chain issues impacting the cost of materials. We've got labor and workforce issues impacting the cost of construction. We've got labor and workforce issues impacting our nonprofits. So, you know, things are going to cost more now. So that's something to take into consideration. Definitely. You know, we didn't mention the word escalation when we were talking earlier, but that's always part of the deal from when they start to when they actually go to do it. That's always a consideration. The goal is, is escalation and cost. So that is definitely a good point. Yeah. Sticker, sticker shock is a good point. I'm going to stick with um, more of the positive and maybe you want to call me Pollyanna, right? But really looking at, to Alan's point, 
Zoom interviews are okay. And you can actually see a lot about that person. You know, just now, Rich, looking at you in a video component, I very clearly see you are into music and that helps me to open a conversation. There's wonderful information that surrounds us in this digital space. The other thing is I know that many of us that did not stop during COVID, or I should say the height of COVID, have closed many large gifts into this virtual space, even old school telephone style, like gifts are being closed. And that's because of that return on relationship is so critical that if we leaned in to that relationship and we are working and stewarding the donor in a proper transformational way, they're ready. They're ready to give. Oh, and Jarrett, that's such a good point. That is such a good point because of all these organizations that are now coming out of COVID and dusting off these projects and potentially going into campaigns. We're going to see a competition for donors, which means those organizations that have kept things moving forward and kept building those relationships with donors, they should be okay. But if you haven't built a relationship with donors, you might run into a little bit of an issue now. The other thing we are coming up to very soon is a presidential campaign. That, as we know, also impacts philanthropy from that political fundraising standpoint. And as we move into a presidential campaign, that is another barrier to potential success because people are bifurcating where they are spending their dollars. Great points, Jarrett. Thank you. We are getting to that part of the show where we need to wrap up. So I want to ask for final takeaways. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you want to talk about? Jarrett. That's a good question. My takeaway was going to be for those of you that are listening and considering a capital or wondering if the time is right or is the time right now or in the near future, hopefully what you've heard, Rich and Alan and I really, you know, drive home is start with that feasibility study, because I really do believe that the time is right and it's right right now to begin the process, to at least start having those conversations to see if a capital campaign is in our future. And if so, what does that look like? And if not, what might we do and focus on so that we could have a successful campaign in the future? That's my big takeaway. It does not cost you anything to have a conversation with a consultant and learn if having a capital campaign is for you. Terrific. Alan? I, I would say that I would position a campaign within your organization as leaving the organization with um, greater capacity. It's more of a capacity building than competing with your annual program. I think if you have those conversations where people are feeling like they're gonna lose annual donors, it's gonna be harder to move forward. What the, the way I would present it to clients and talk within my organization is that at the end, you're gonna be at a different spot with your fundraising. You're gonna have raised that bar and you're gonna be able to raise more money ongoing as opposed to having a project done that cannibalized your annual giving. I think that's an excellent point. There's a lot of ways to build a comprehensive campaign so that you're not cannibalizing that annual giving. I think for me, it would be to own your role as a nonprofit authority in whatever it is that you do and to, to take on this transformational change that you are attempting. Make sure that you have all of your ducks in a row internally and go forth boldly and fearlessly and ask for what you need to get the job done. So, Jarrett Ransom, where can folks find out more about you? I'd love for people to find me. You can certainly find me on the IPM Consulting roster. Would love to work with you there. Also on Instagram, nonprofit underscore nerd. So you can find me nerding out there on Instagram. Facebook, LinkedIn, I, well, I, I would almost bet you $5 that I am the only female Jarrett Ransom on LinkedIn, and I'm very active on LinkedIn. So come on over and join me on social. Thank you. And I think I follow you on all of those places. Alan, where can we find out more about you? That's where you guys are the nerd and I'm not as far as the social media but I am also in the IPM Consulting Network and would love to connect with people there or by email, alan, A-L-A-N, at alannoblock.com. And that's uh, where you can reach me. Alan, Jarrett, 
thank you for joining me today to talk about many, but not all things, capital campaigns. Listeners, if you'd like to know more about how IPM can help you with your capital campaign plans, please reach out to us at ipmadvancement.com forward slash contact. And if you missed our episode on feasibility studies, you can hear Alan and others on episode 19 of NPFX. As always, thank you for listening. We'll see you next time on the Nonprofit Fundraising Exchange. That concludes this episode of the Nonprofit Fundraising Exchange. Thanks to our panel for sharing their insights and expertise. If you'd like to learn more about our panel members or any of the organizations or resources featured in this episode, we will include links in the show notes. If you like this podcast, we would love your help spreading the word. First, please subscribe in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app, so you always know when a new episode is released. Second, forward the episodes you like to friends and colleagues, or share them on social media. Word of mouth is one of the best ways you can help us reach more nonprofit professionals like yourself. And if you use Apple Podcasts or Audible, please leave us a review. Positive reviews are how many listeners decide whether or not to try out a new podcast. We appreciate your help. For suggestions on topics, guests, or nonprofit organizations you'd like to hear on the podcast, send an email with the subject heading NPFX suggestion to contact at ipmadvancement.com. For back episodes and more resources like white papers, infographics, and blog articles, please visit the free IPM Advancement Nonprofit Resource Library at ipmadvancement.com forward slash resources. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.